Hey, good morning and welcome everybody to BC 308, our course on Rev Daniel and Revelation. We, um, we will be hopefully completing our course today in the time that we have. Let's uh, pray and get started. Could somebody please lead us in prayer and then we will get started. Sorry, Asha, were you praying or? Can you pray, Pastor? Yes, go ahead. Dear God, thank you so much, God, for this day. Thank you for my classmates and Pastor God as we're about to learn the book of Revelation, God, that you have been opened, um, revealing what is when, what's happening and what is yet to come, Lord. Thank you so much, God, as we learn that you fill us with your wisdom and knowledge. And God, that we may not just uh, be the person who just hears, but also understand the being the doer of what we have learned, God, that uh, preparing our soul for the souls that are uh, perishing and not knowing who you are, God, that we have our hearts to be ready to go and share the good news to those who are perishing, God. We thank you so much, God, for this class as we are learning, that we may understand the deeper um, truths that you have revealed to John. God, thank you so much for everything. We need to pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, good morning, everyone, once again. Thank you so much for joining the class today. And um, we are going to um, pick up from where we paused last week, and then we will finish Revelation. And then we'll do a quick review of Daniel and Revelation. I mean, just more like a overview, quick review, just to get everything together. And then uh, we'll just leave it open for some time for questions, interaction, anything you want to ask. Uh, we will do that. And I'll just share a couple of thoughts about uh, opportunities that, I, that lie ahead after your graduation. And with that, we will be done. So that's the plan for today. Uh, we may finish all of this in the first hour, or we may take the second hour, uh, if needed, just depending on how much of uh, interaction happens and questions come up. Okay, all right. So we were in Revelation chapter twenty, and uh, we were at that point. Uh, this is around verse ten till about verse ten. That's uh, where we paused last week. So we were at the point where the Battle of Armageddon has taken place. Christ comes from the heavens with all of the angelic hosts, the, the armies of heaven, he, and uh, the nations have gathered together against God's people, against Israel. Primarily, the real reason is to divide up the land. And, and of course, there are a lot of things that contribute to the movement there. And at that time, Christ returns, he descends on Mount Olives, the exact place from where he ascended, he descends. And just by the word of his mouth, just by his word, uh, you know, uh, he brings everything to a close. People are destroyed and, and the armies are destroyed and the war comes to an end. After that, Satan uh, is bound, um, the, so the fault, the Antichrist and the false prophet are bound, taken out of the way. Satan is bound and his demons are bound for a thousand years, taken out of the way. So we literally transition into what we call as the millennium or the thousand year reign of Christ on the earth. Uh, so in that transition point, there is what we saw last week, uh, the Resurrection from the dead, that means those who have died during the tribulation, they are raised back to life. So they can rule and reign with Christ. Those, I mean, those who have believed in Christ and died during the tribulation, 
are raised back to life so that the saints, all the saints, can reign with Christ for 1,000 years. So Christ rules and reigns on the earth for 1,000 years. So that's the what, what we commonly refer to as the millennium, the thousand year reign of Christ. At the end of the thousand, so during that thousand years, the Bible discloses a little bit about what life will be like. Uh, we, we, we made mention of Isaiah 65, of Isaiah chapter 11, uh, uh, where it mentions, gives us a little bit of insight of things, life on earth. Uh, we could say that the nature of things is changed during that millennial reign of Christ. Satan is taken out of the way. His demons are taken out of the way. So the very nature of things is changed. Uh, the Bible talks about people beating their swords into plowshares. The Bible talks about the lion and the lamb staying together, you know, lying together. That means uh, that that whole the very nature of things. The child will play with the snake, you know. So all the things that are not you don't see now, you're going to see happen. So the very nature of things are changed. Nations are going to come to worship the Lord, Zechariah 14, in Jerusalem and so on. And we are going to administer the kingdom. At the end of a thousand years, we read in Revelation 20 that Satan is released for a very brief period of time. We don't know exactly what that duration is. The Bible just says for a brief time. Uh, this is his final chance, uh, but he succeeds in deceiving people and makes a final attempt against the city of Jerusalem, against the city of God. God intervenes, and uh, this is it. Right? So Satan is then forever sent into the lake of fire. So this is verse 10, Revelation 20, verse 10. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night. So we stop there. So let's pick up from verse 11, Revelation 20, verse 11. You all with me so far? Just, just to, that is a quick recap of last, where we finished. Revelation 20, let's read from verses 11 to 15, please. Um, three verses each, anyone could start. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15. I start from verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the book. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and the dead and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. I can read, read the um, next two verses also, please. Sorry. You want to read the next two verses? Yes, please. Yes, okay, please. Then, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Verse 15. According to anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Mm. So this, so the final thing that happens to life on this planet, as we know it, final thing, is the great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment. So this is, is the passage that we just read where the Bible says every human person, every human being who ever lived is going to be standing before the throne of God. And the book of life will be open. And uh, and Jesus described this in Matthew 25, if you remember, where Jesus talked about the sheep and the goats. So he was describing what we refer, what 
this passage refers to as the great white throne judgment. So that means people are separated, the sheep and the goats, uh, representing those who are in the kingdom, those who are not in the kingdom. God the Father, God is seated on the throne and the books are open. But you know, we're already separated according to if your name is in the book of life, you're there on the sheep side. Your book is your name is not in the book of life, you're there on the goat side, and then that's the, the judgment is pronounced. Right? So the Bible here is saying Revelation 20, every person who ever lived is 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 brought back to life. You know, people have died in the sea, of course, he's saying basically he's saying, look, our bodies may have disintegrated but we are made to stand before the throne of God in judgment. Now, of course, a question people would ask is, what kind of bodies would these people be in, right? So example, we know that believers are receiving a resurrected, glorified, immortal body, right? So when we are resurrected as believers. You know, First Corinthians 15 describes that very clearly, that we receive glorified bodies that is like the body of Christ. But what about these other people, the people who are not saved, who are, everybody's raised up now, what kind of bodies would they have or would, would they even have bodies and so on? Um, we don't know the answer. The Bible is not telling us necessarily, specifically, the same way in which First Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 13, Philippians 3 talk about the bodies of those who have died in Christ when they are resurrected, where it's very specifically stated. We don't have text that specifically describes what kind of bodies would those who have who are resurrected, who are raised up, but they're not in Christ. What kind of bodies would they have? We don't know. But what we do know from this, from what's described here, here is, is that they are sent away into the lake of fire, which is referred to as the second death. And that is a place of torment, of eternal torment, meaning uh, it's not like they're not going to feel the judgment. It's going to be a place of eternal torment where they can feel in being in that place, the lake of fire. So Jesus put it like this. He says, the worm will not be burnt, meaning it will not be destroyed. I mean, there's, there's fire, but the people there are not annihilated. They're there. They're experiencing judgment. Now, you know, some other questions that people ask generally is, is the lake of fire just uh, a picture of torment or is it literal fire? You know, now, again, we don't, we don't, we can't say anything other than what we see in scriptures. And uh, the Bible always is referring to this as a lake of fire. Uh, it's a place of torment, a place of intense pain, whether it's literal fire or whether it's fire representing something that's going to be pain. We don't know. None of us have been there. so. Uh, but we just take it at, at, as it's stated. It is a place of fire uh, and it'll be a place of eternal torment, of you know significant uh, suffering, right? So, uh, we, we can't prove the prove or disprove either either position. Uh, so we just, if, from our perspective, we'll just take it at its face value as it's described. There is literal fire. Nobody can prove it or disprove it. In that sense, some people have had experiences, but you know, remember, it's that experience, uh, a, a certain out of body experiences. But from the scripture text. We just take it as it's as it is stated, a place of fire and of eternal torment. Okay, so this is referred to as the second death. 
So it's interesting in chapter 20, there is what is referred to as the first resurrection and as the second death. The first resurrection referring to those who have died in Christ in the tribulation, during the tribulation, they're going to be raised up at the end of the tribulation after the battle of Armageddon, first resurrection. Second death is the lake of fire. So obviously the first death would be the physical death. You, your life on earth has ended. You're, separ you're separated from this life. Second death is the eternal separation from God in the lake of fire. Any questions on this? Are things clear? Any clarifications? Pastor? Yes, yeah, go ahead. You made reference to Matthew 25 about separation of the sheep and the is it goats? Yeah, goats. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um and likened it to verse eleven to fifteen. Um I know that these people are referred to as the people here who are likened to the goats, but I'm just wondering if there will be a category of sheep or our suppression has already happened before now. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, the saints, so the believers, they've already been separated. Okay, all right. Yeah, okay. because uh, it's happened, you know, in the rapture of the church. So if you go back in time, when Christ ascended, he took the Old Testament saints with him. The rapture of the church is the New Testament saints taken up. After the resur after the tribulation, the, uh, another set of saints are resurrected. We are all ruling and reigning. Then there is the millennium, where of course there are going to be people who believe in Jesus, saved during that time. So this, the, the the separation has already been happening, but this is like the grand finale, the sheep and the goats, right? So, so, sorry, sir, you, you mentioned the Old Testament saints separated do you mean in spirit or do you have resurrected like jesus in a graveyard way so now the old testament saints are in spirit right they oh, have okay. been they oh. have been taken out of paradise, paradise. so parad paradise has yeah. take, been taken up into heaven right so okay. they, oh. they were been taken transported they oh. will all receive their glorified bodies along with the new testament saints at the rapture of the church that's because Hebrews chapter 11, verse 33 to 33 says you know, that we will be perfected together. Right? So, uh, based on that. I just want to draw one... Thank you, you for the clarification, sir. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. Uh, I just want to draw one, uh, just bring this to our attention. Remember, there are, there is the great white throne judgment, which we are reading right now, Revelation 20, 11 to 15. But this great white throne judgment is not the judgment of the believers. The judgment of the believers we saw takes place separately in heaven. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and 2 Corinthians chapter 5. These two passages talk, talk about the judgment of the believers. That judgment of the believers, some people technically call it the Bema seat judgment, B E M A, Bema seat, that's just, they're just using the Greek word, the Bema seat. That judgment is a reward. It's a rewards, it's, it's, it's a, re, a, a distribution of rewards for the work you've done for the kingdom. So the Bema judgment is different from the great white throne judgment. Bema judgment is for believers. Is based on First Corinthians chapter three, Second Corinthians chapter five, and it takes place during the tribulation on earth. The saints are there in heaven; they are given their gift awards. The great white throne is different. It happens at the very end of life on earth, as we know it. Is that okay? So just uh, don't mix the two. These are two separate judgments that we read about in Scripture. So as you're reading Scripture, if you come to 1 Corinthians 3 and read about, you know, our works being tested, or you come to 
Second Corinthians 5, Paul says, uh, we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Remember, that judgment is different from the great white throne judgment, which in the great white throne judgment, there are the sheep and the goats. Uh, even the non-believers are there. Okay? Go ahead, say your question. So, Pastor, in other words, what you're saying is that when we read Matthew 25, the parable of the goat and the sheep, it's basically just symbolic of the separation of the church and those who died in Christ and then those who will be judged at the white throne judgment, not per se the, 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 the church and the unbelievers standing together to be judged. Am I correct to say that, sir? Um. So it's not, so actually bo both of what you said are correct and they apply to Matthew 25, Revelation 20 because it is the place where there are the sheep and the goats, that is those who believe in Christ and those who don't believe in Christ. It is a judgment because it is saying you're going to be dismissed into the lake of fire and you're going to enter into the future kingdom based on your name being in the book of life so it is a judgment but it is not the rewards of the saints that is done separately in the bema seat okay okay Claire. thank you pastor thank you yeah okay good any other questions? Let's jump now into chapter 21 and 22. So what happens now? After the great white throne judgment, it's the end of this planet as we know it. And it's the end of this universe as we know it. What will happen? Let's just turn to Second Peter chapter three. So we're going to come back to Revelation twenty-one, but Second Peter three gives us uh, uh, this uh, in detail. Second Peter chapter three, verses one to thirteen. Second Peter chapter three, uh, or we can read verse one to fourteen. Second Peter three, one to fourteen. Three verses, please. Let's read. This is now the second letter that I'm writing to you. Beloved, in both of them, restore you the sincere mind by prayer and reminder that you should remember the protections of the holy prophets and commandments of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoff scoffing, following their own sinful desires. Thank you. Was force on somebody? And saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers uh, fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this, they will they will fully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were, were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. Was seven somebody? But the heavens and the earth, which are uh, now preserved by the same word and reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as, a one, as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackless, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Thank you. We're standing on somebody. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, and in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat, 
both the earth and the works are in it will be burnt up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Amen. Um, thank you. Verses 13 and 14, somebody. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Mm. Amen. So, Peter gives us uh, a lot of you know, significant details of what's going to happen. So he says, you know, people have been scoffing and mocking, asking us, um, you know, where, when is this going to happen? Where is the day of his coming? All of those kinds of things. And so Peter's reminding us, he says, you know, I want you to understand this, that, you know, with God, time is, time doesn't matter. Um, so essentially, he, he's making the statement, a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like a day, meaning with God, time time doesn't matter. O only for us, you know, we feel like, okay, where is the day of his coming and why is it so delayed and everything seems to be just going on as it was from the beginning, etc. So look, with God, time doesn't matter. And he's going to come just as he promised through the mouth of the prophets. And then he gives us what is going to happen. He says, the most significant thing in Peter's writing is Peter says that the heavens are going to melt. It's going to be dissolved. And of course, uh, he, even the earth, the heavens and the earth. So this planet as we know it and the heavens. So when the Bible is using heavens here, you know, we use the word universe. It's talking about all the far, ex vast expanse of this universe. Everything is going to be dissolved. Now, how and all of that is, he says, look, it, everything happened by the word of the Lord. So obviously everything can be taken care of by the word of the Lord. Through, through, um, it says everything will be dissolved by fire. The elements will melt with fervent heat. And verse 13, there will be new heavens and a new earth. So everything is going to be changed. Now, it's obviously hard for us to fathom this right so in our minds we're going to think about you know these 14 some billion light years this expands this universe that's so vast and so big how is all this going to you know how how is all this going to be changed how is all this going to be dissolved uh well that's where god is bigger the creator who created everything is bigger and all of this, and how he's going to renovate it, how he's going to change it. Peter just says there's going to be new heavens and a new earth. Everything's going to be renovated by fire. Right? So, although in our minds we can't fathom this, we just leave that to God. God's going to do it. The creator of everything is going to do it. So we come back to Revelation 21. And John is transitioning from the great white throne judgment to something new. He begins Revelation 21 saying, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. So he's transitioned. But Peter's passage is telling us a little bit about how this transition happens. God will dissolve everything with fervent heat. He'll dissolve everything. And there will be new heavens and new earth. And John is looking up forward and he says, this is what I'm seeing. Okay. So let's pick up in Revelation 21. Let's read. So Revelation 21 and 22 are essentially uh, a description to us about new heavens and new earth. 
So all we can say, I mean, as we read it, you know, remember John is seeing something way out into the future. And like we have been saying over and over again, John will have to use his language. He's, he has to use whatever knowledge he has to communicate something that's totally out of this world, right? Literally, it's, it's new heavens, new earth. John is seeing all this, and then he has to connect it back to his language, his earthly knowledge, and therefore he uses certain things that he knows and he has to try to capture what he is saying. Okay, meaning we have to understand that the new heavens and new earth would probably most likely be so much more greater than what has been communicated to us in chapters 21 and 22. Right? These, these are words to communicate to us as humans in a language and a way we can understand of something that is, like Paul says, it far outweighs any glory that we've ever seen. It's, it's way beyond. Right? What eyes have not seen, what man has never imagined, such things God has prepared. And we are trying to articulate that in, 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 in human terms. Okay, So let's read Revelation 21, three verses each place, starting with verse 1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, no sorrow, no cry. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new, and he said to me, Write for those words are true and faithful. He said, and he said to me, it's, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life, fill it of whom to thirst. Mm. Now, just some comments before we keep reading new heavens and the new earth john john says verse one he sees this and he's trying to tell us certain you know certain things he's observing he observes that in this so the first heaven first earth is gone so there's nothing resembling this present earth or this present heavens now by heavens we're referring to this entire universe. It's, it's gone. And in this new heaven, new earth, John says, there's no sea. I don't, I don't find water. So we know today our earth is largely covered. I mean, there's land and there's huge portion of water. John saying, hey, there's something strange about this new earth. In this new earth, I don't see water surface. I don't see the sea. I don't see it. Reason is, verse 6, God is saying, I am the one who gives this water of life freely. So something's changed in this new earth. In that new earth, we don't drink water like we normally, like we do now, but there's something flowing out of God, his life itself. So water representing life, his life is flowing directly into us, making us like, you know, we don't, you don't need to drink this water. And then there are other things he sees. He sees a city coming down from heaven. So this is the city. Like when you when you read about Abraham in Hebrews 11, it says Abraham was looking for a city 
whose builder and maker is God. Hebrews 11. That means somehow Abraham knew in his heart that though you know God had promised him that land and Jerusalem and all of those things, you know, he was he was engaged here on earth. He knew in him there's something beyond this. There's a city that God Himself is building. And this is called the New Jerusalem or Heavenly Jerusalem, a city that God has built. And that city comes and rests upon this new earth. So much so that God is now dwelling with man, literally. And God is declaring all things are new now. Right? I am the beginning and the end, Alpha and Omega, everything is new. And in this new earth, and there is this city that God Himself has built. There is no death, no sorrow, no crying, no pain. Everything is gone. So we just have to imagine this is what God is working towards. And although today this planet is in a big mess, I mean, there are good things happening, of course, but there's a lot of pain and sorrow and death. We look ahead, there's a city, there's an earth, where none of that will be. Let's pick up in verse 7 onwards, please. Three verses each. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexual more sorceries, adulteries, and colors, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the, uh, in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Also, she had, she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gate, and names written on them which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of israel okay verse 13 on please so verse 13 on the east three gates on the north three gates on the south three gates and on the west three gates and the wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the 12 names the 12 apostles of the lamb and the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and the wall and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width, and he measured the city with his rod, twelve thousand stadia, its length and width and height are equal. Mm. So John is thank you. I just pause for a few comments. So John is seeing, he's continuing to see this holy Jerusalem, heavenly Jerusalem, new Jerusalem, the city that God has built to come and descend on the earth. So remember, this is a city, not a nation. It's a city where people are going to dwell. John is down. And then he's recognizing some things about the city. He's seeing that it's got, you know, it's some, somewhat like a rectangular shape. Uh, there are uh, the names of the 12 tribes. There are the names of the 12 apostles. In other words, God is honoring in this heavenly city. He's honoring, in some way, there's a connect back to an earth that was before, life on earth before. The 12 tribes, the 12 apostles. There's a memorial, memorial or a remembrance of those. And the city is so vast. Remember, it's a city. It's so big. He says, it's 1,000, 
380 miles. So each dimension is 1,380 miles. And I was just looking at it. It's somewhere, like if, if I put it in, in something that I understand, like on the map of India, it's coast to coast uh, along the largest length, um, coast to coast, 1,380 miles almost. And this is a city. It's not a single city. It's so vast. Right? Talking about how uh, immense this is. Now, whether the city, you know, is is only so much, or you know, you know, where all we are going to live, people are going to live. Are, they, are we going to live only inside the city or other parts of the earth? You know, we don't know. And don't worry about all of that. How big is the new Earth going to be? Is this, is it going to be the same size of the Earth as we know it today, or is it going to be different size? We don't know how big the new Earth is going to be, right? So John is just giving us what he is able to see, what he's able to comprehend. He's put it down for us, and we are able to comprehend it today. So there's obviously a lot of things that we don't know about this new Earth. Uh, you know, like you ask, you know, how big is the new Earth? We don't know. Be just looking at the information given to us in this chapter. Say so you had a question. Yes, Pastor. Sorry, it was kind of in line with what you just mentioned. I don't know if if we have an answer. Uh, I don't. I know I've heard some preachers talk about a certain group of people that can only live in this city while others will be living outside of the city. I don't know if you mm. buy into that doctrine, or maybe you can throw more light pertaining to what we've just read on this. Mm. Uh, what we do know is that all of God's people, all those who have been saved, like all those you know, who've, who've put their faith in Christ, all those who are saved, are going to be in this new city, are going to be in this new Earth, this new place that God is going to provide for us. So every believer is going to be there. What do we know is that uh, we are going to be coming to worship God. We are going to be, see, like he says already in the earlier verse, uh, uh, verse 7, whoever overcomes will inherit all things. I will be his God and he shall be my son. So that means... God is there, we are his children, we're going to come in and out. There is no indication, other than the other than those who have already been separated in the lake of fire, there is no indication of any other distinction between or among God's people themselves. Like, like what you just described, you know, only certain of God's people can come inside the city and others being outside. There is no chapter and verse to back that up. So all we can say is, God being Father, we are all His sons and daughters. We will all be having access to everything that's there in this new city and this new earth that He provides for us. There's no chapter and verse that, uh, you know, says, okay, these kinds of saints cannot enter heaven and things like that. So I think that is more of perhaps an imagination at work. And so we can just let it go. Thank you, Pastor. All right, let's pick up from verse 17, please. Three verses each. Verse 17, the angel measured the wall using human measurement, and it was 144 cubic tick. The wall was made of jasper, and the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, second sapphira, and the third gates, and the third agate, sorry, and the third agate, and the fourth emerald. Let's ready on. The fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh 
chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth uh, chrysophras, the eleventh uh, jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was a was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. Shall I continue? Yes, continue. Thank you. But, but I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all, by day, there shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. But there shall be, there shall by no means enter, enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie. But they, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Mm, thank you. So John is trying to capture for us how magnificent the splendor of the city is. So he's just probably naming every special stone he knows. He says, like, I'm seeing this color, I'm seeing this color. I mean, it's, it's so vibrant, it's so full of life, so full of color, and he's naming all of this. So, you know, I think this is how amazing the city is. And if we, even if we try to think, you know, we can't imagine what was this brilliance, what was this, you know how how majestic this city would be, but he's saying I'm seeing how the city looks like, and he says uh, the the street was of pure gold. It was like transparent glass. The every gate was this one big pearl, and uh, and he looks and sees no sun, no moon. So even like we're saying, this whole heavens around this new earth is different. The heavens that we know today, there is the sun, the moon, the, all these stars, other planetary bodies. Over there, he's saying there's no need for that. Right? So it's something very different. God himself is the source of light. God himself is the source of the water or the life for the people. And as we said, only the saints are there. Meaning there's names, whose, who, the people whose names are in the book of life. They're the only ones on this planet on or on this new earth uh, uh, you know we may not call it planet but planet is a word that you know in connection with the present earth but in the new earth the only people living on that new earth are those whose names were written in the book of life because we saw in the great white throne judgment all the others were sent away to the lake of fire so only those whose names are written in the book of life are on that new earth and they have full free access they come in and go out uh, John seems to recognize John seems to recognize kings of the earth, meaning people who, you know, who, who, on the earth, were people of great uh, influence. Maybe they were rulers. Maybe you know, whatever, great people. But they're also part of this whole, you know, nations coming to worship God, and they're they're coming to uh, ascribe greatness to God, right? And they're coming to honor God. So he's seeing all of this. He's just saying, look, God himself is the center. He's the focus. People are coming in and out. God himself is the light of this city. Right? So we can only imagine, based on John's description and whatever he's used, how glorious, how wonderful this is going to be. Okay? All right. So what we're going to do now, we'll take a quick 10-minute break. Uh, we'll come back and we will be able to complete chapter 22. And uh, hopefully in the next hour, we will finish everything. Okay, so let's take a 10-minute break and we'll be right back. Thank you.